Well, you have my um, geraniums here joining me today. Welcome, welcome to you. We've been overwintering this geranium and it started to flower, so we have uh, taken some cuttings and we're rooting them so that we can have beautiful geraniums on our porch very soon, just like you maybe. So here we are again. Um, welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Bellingham. So glad you're joining me today again. Um, today, the topic for the year, as you know, is who do we choose to be, which is a fabulous question that I've really been thinking a lot about during this pandemic. And our April theme is the medicine of truth. And that also is the theme for my talk today, the medicine of truth. And um, I wanted to read you something that Gabriel Roth wrote. She was an incredible person. This is one of, one of her quotes. <clears throat> In many shamanic societies, if you came to a medicine person complaining of being disheartened, dispirited, or depressed, they would ask one of four questions. When did you stop dancing? When did you stop singing? When did you stop being enchanted by stories? And when did you stop being comforted by the sweet territory of silence? And I think those are great questions to examine today um, in, in, the, in the way of the medicine of truth for ourselves. Um, particularly that last one, when did you stop being comforted by this sweet territory of silence? And uh, I'm remembering a Rumi quote that silence is the language of God. And I know for a lot of us right now, the pandemic has hit a new level of discomfort. Maybe not for you. Maybe you're one of the fortunate ones that you're going along, you're sailing along, everything's pretty much normal, you're okay. But you probably also know a, a few people who uh, really are struggling with this enforced stay home, stay healthy order that we're under here in Washington State. So I have some pandemic thoughts around the medicine of truth. My, my first pandemic thought is, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I really do feel like this time is a gift. It's not a gift that I wanted. It's not a gift that I particularly am enjoying unwrapping sometimes. And yet I'm very aware um, that there is a gift contained within this time apart from the, the life that we were living. I don't want to call it normal, but the life we were living. And for me, part of the gift as a spiritual person is the opportunity to really pause and look deeply at my inner landscape, what's going on there. And, um, and as I do that, I'm thinking a lot about some of the areas that I was not particularly satisfied with in my life, I wasn't happy with. Often nothing outwardly, but more of an inner state of stress or an inner state of anxiety or an inner state of feeling not quite accurate in how I was living my life. I don't know if you had this as well. And examining now at an inner level what that might have been about, I, I've come to some uh, remembrances. The first is, for me, a long time ago, I was a student of Eknath Aswaran, an incredible man. And um, he, one of his teachings was that the ego is a fabulous servant and a horrible master. And that all too often our egoic nature um, sets itself up on the throne of our reality without us even noticing right at first and then begins to order our lives according to its agenda. And its agenda um, is, as you've heard me say before perhaps, is first of all survival. And that's where it's such a great servant. The ego's role in our makeup um, is to make sure that we stay alive and that we are able to traverse the journey of our life 
in relative safety. It's a great thing. So, you know, we're, we're from a very early age. We train our egos, our parents help. Um, I can remember singing to my children a song when they were learning to cross the street. Stop, look and listen before you cross the street. Well, what is that? That is me training their ego on how to keep them safe in a world where there's a lot of fast moving vehicles. So ego, first job, safety. Great, good servant, good thing to have. Second job of the ego, to make sure that we're right. And it goes back to the first job. If we're right in our opinions, if we're right in how we're living, if we're right about ourselves, then we're safe. And if we're wrong, we're not. And you can see there's a problem with that dynamic because learning, for example, is one way that we grow and evolve as sacred humans. But learning involves being wrong a lot, especially right at first, you may have noticed. I was not a particularly fabulous student at higher math. And to be able to learn higher math, I had to be wrong a lot. And I was excited right at first, I don't know about you, but when I first took algebra and the answers were in the back of the book, I thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna be okay. Except that I couldn't figure out how they got to the answer. I had a lot of wrong time before I got to right time. And the ego doesn't like that. It feels like we have entered into an unsafe territory. So it likes us to be right and it likes us to be safe. And in that trajectory, often, as Swaran would say, that's why it takes the throne, is it perceives our spiritual path and our spiritual evolution as uh, moving into territory that is not known to us, that is not safe, that is not predictable, that spiritual growth above all things, really, above almost anything else we can engage in as sacred humans, is the territory of being wrong and exploration and um, a lack of safety feeling as we explore the uncomfortable edges of our evolving self. So we have to depose the ego. We have to kick it off the throne. We have to put it back where it is a servant and not a master. And in this time of pandemic, the reason I'm bringing you this teaching about the ego is because I've noticed in myself that the ego that I had so successfully, I thought, turned into a very lovely servant is trying to take over as master in this time of fear. And that's when the ego is particularly activated, is when there's a pandemic of fear in any sense, the ego is now on high alert and wants to make sure we're safe. And so I've noticed during the pandemic, even though I'm sitting in a beautiful home, I'm sitting in a beautiful city, I'm surrounded, maybe not physically, but I'm surrounded in my mind with all of you who are such wonderful souls. Even though all of that is going on, because there's a level of fear that's being experienced by all of us kind of floating around in the field, my ego is on high alert. And because of that, it keeps wanting to take me to old patterns of being that make it feel safe. So I'm eating more. I don't know if you've had this. I'm not eating out of boredom. I'm eating out of feelings of not being safe. And eating makes me feel safe, apparently. And there's all kinds of patterns like that that show up in times like this that it's really important to pay attention to. Why? Because this is the gift. This is part of the gift. This is the gift of this time is, wow, we have this incredible mirror that can shine back to us the places that are not entirely evolved, that still need to be worked on, that still need to be co-created again and again and again to move us out of these habituated ways of uh, thinking and feeling and responding. And so what a gift to have the ego show up in its more habituated, masterful ways, and we get to take a good look at that and then make some new choices. Um, I also am aware of discomfort. And uh, we, I don't, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna say I 
live a very comfortable life compared to 99% of the population of the world. I have clean running water, I have enough food, I have uh, heat when it's cold, and I have windows that open, and I have loving people around me, etc., etc., etc. I live very comfortably, and I bet many of you do too. And because of that, oddly, we're not as um, acclimated to working with discomfort as some of our fellow sacred humans. In fact, discomfort for many people in the West is a sign that something's wrong. And I wanna propose that during the pandemic, actually discomfort is a sign of something right. Um, but here's the deal. Because we're not acclimated to working with discomfort, spiritual discomfort, physical discomfort, emotional discomfort, mental discomfort, what the masterful ego wants to do with it is it wants to practice every trick in the book that it's got, and this includes things like distraction. Are you binge watching things? It includes things like division, um, looking at uh, news feeds and doing a bunch of judgmental us and them thinking, dividing, 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 instead of uniting, uniting, united. The ego also wants to go into denial, take us into denial. I'm okay, I'm fine. I don't know what all big hullabaloo is. Nothing's gonna get me. Or the other kind of denial, well, all this work that I've been doing spiritually just hasn't served me well and so it's all a bunch of hooey, there's that. And then there's outright deception. The ego will actually go to a place to keep us safe where it actually practices deception and it uses the, the field of our perception to get us to think that things are going on that aren't going on or to um, kind of obscure what's actually happening so that we don't have to think about it, um, which is like the, the mega distracting kind of way of being. So discomfort, what do we do with it if we don't allow the ego to master us and take us out of it by using all these mechanisms it has at its disposal? Well, um, discomfort is really a signal or a, a messenger of something that is really important for us to pay attention to. And so I was, I was looking, you, the quote, if you went on our website today with this talk is from a spiritual teacher that I really enjoy named Ajashanti. And Ajashanti said this, it's from the depth of your being that the true answer springs spontaneously forth. And I underlined the depth in my notes because I wanted to remind myself that discomfort is actually a messenger from my innermost being seeking to awaken me to something that I need to pay attention to. It's one of those true answers, the medicine of truth, but it sometimes comes in an uncomfortable form. So that made me think about, of course, a story. And um, it's a story maybe you've heard because it's a universal story. Um, I first heard it associated with the Sufis, but it's a story that you can find in any culture. And if you've been coming to the center, you've heard me tell it at least once. So here's the story. Would you like to hear it? I'm hearing a yes. <laughs> All storytellers need to have a yes. So this is a story about um, a beggar and a box and a mystic. So there is this beggar and he is, he is the poorest of the poor. He barely gets by every single day. And the way he does that is the only thing he has besides the clothes on his back is he has a box that he was gifted um, by his father to have to sit on at the city gates so that he could sit in comfort while he was begging for money and food so that he could sustain himself day by day. So every morning, early, early before anyone is awakened, the beggar would drag his box over to the city gate and he would sit on his box and lean against the wall and begin his begging practice as the first people arose and started to come into the city to do commerce. And he was a fixture. 
And so every day people passing in and out knew that they would encounter this beggar on his box. And um, he, he did okay, you know, he made enough so that he wasn't starving, but it was a subsistence living. Well, one day he's, he's uh, sitting on his box doing his shtick and along comes a very mysterious elder. And he's very different than most of the people that are moving in and out of the city. He's clearly a stranger from afar. He doesn't seem to speak a language that's very clear. He's dressed in very unusual clothes. And as the beggar sees him coming, he thinks to himself, oh, I hope he doesn't come near me. He's, he's unusual, he's different. But of course, the stranger comes right up to the beggar and the beggar is kind of like doing his thing. He's begging for food, he's begging for money. And the stranger looks at the beggar for a long time and he says, why are you doing this? And um, the beggar gets angry and says, what do you mean why am I doing this? I'm doing this because I need enough food and money to live on. And the, and the stranger says, what about the box? And the beggar goes, what about the box? It's the only thing I own. It's, it makes me comfortable. What about the box? And the stranger just nods and goes into the city. Well, the, it takes a, the beggar a long time to calm down and night comes and he drags the box back to where he, he's got his little encampment. And he's looking at the box and he's thinking about the stranger and he thinks, what do you mean, what about the box? What's that about? And he looks at the box and he thinks, it's, 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 it's a box. My dad gave me the box. It's a box, but he can't seem to get the stranger out of his mind. And he's looking at the box and he's thinking about the question. And so he thinks to himself, okay, fine. Let me look at the box. I mean, I've been using it, let me look at it. So he goes over and the box doesn't look like there's any way to open it. It just looks like a, a box with no opening or anything. But as he begins to examine the box, he realizes, well, actually, there's a way to open it. And so he figures that out. It's a secret kind of latch kind of thing. And he opens the box. And within the box is a treasure, a treasure untold how much it's worth. So valuable. And he's been dragging this treasure back and forth, back and forth, begging for money when all the time he was sitting on a treasure. That's the story. Well, it's a great story for a pandemic time when we're experiencing discomfort because the discomfort really is kind of like the stranger visiting us, asking us to pay attention to what we're sitting on, to what we have, asking us, why are you begging in the outer world when there is an inner realm filled with all you need? It's really an important question. And you know, as I, was, as I was thinking about that, I was thinking part of the treasure that we have is what Aja Shanti was saying, that from the depth of our very being, true answers spring spontaneously forth. The thing is, just like the box, we have to find our way into the depth of our being. And sometimes that seems like an impossible task when fear has us bound up in anxiety and worry and fear about what's going on. And so we somehow have to step aside from those feelings and allow the depth of who we are to arise. Rumi says that one of the ways we can do this is we can start paying attention, like the beggar paid attention for the first time to the box. We can start paying attention to the things that we do from our soul. Because when we do these things from our soul, Rumi says, you feel a river moving in you, a joy. And when action comes from a different place, the feeling disappears. So the treasure we have, I think, in this pandemic time, is we have the ability to pay close attention to our inner realm, to begin to notice the river of joy, the things that we do that bring us joy, and to notice the places where we don't feel joyful when we're doing things and to really begin to assess and pay attention and focus on that. Why? Because the discomfort often is coming 
from doing things that really are not accurate to who we have become. So for me, I've begun to parse out what do I like, and, and I don't mean like, like, you know, in some sort of light way, I'm talking about the depths. What, what am I noticing that is bringing me to my truest self, that is the river of joy that Rumi speaks of, that, that's the depth of my being that Ajashanti is talking about. We all have to find our own way, but I have a couple of action steps and then I'll close. And Amber Darlin, our wonderful music director, is gonna come on at 11 o'clock uh, with some pre-recorded music for you. So these are the action steps that I'm practicing and I recommend them for anyone who's feeling that pandemic discomfort that may be a messenger from your inner realm. First of all, slow down and notice any discomfort. That sounds simple, right? But I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to that their entire day is filled up with Zoom meetings and doing all kinds of stuff, so much so that they're exhausted by the end of their day in a time when we don't have to be. Interesting. So slowing down and noticing. Second, if you feel discomfort in this inner realm, focus on it. Don't don't let the ego vanish it away. Don't be, allow yourself to be distracted or go into denial, but instead look right at it. This is one of Pema Chodron's big teachings. It's a fierce teaching to look at the discomfort, to, to acknowledge it, to notice it. But what we then do, because the ego does not like discomfort, what we then do is what, as we're focusing on it, we have the ability as spiritual beings to surround that discomfort with the spaciousness of mind and heart that we've developed up to this point. We surround that discomfort with compassion and love, and we simply sit with it. Thich Nhat Hanh often describes this like a mother hearing her baby crying in the nursery and going and picking the child up and holding it. And just the simple act of picking up the discomfort, picking up the baby, and holding it with compassion and love calms the baby down, calms the discomfort down enough so that we can actually begin to, to re receive the message that it's trying to give us. And then we ask the question, what, what is the gift here? What am I to understand or know? And your inner knowing will arise spontaneously, as Aja says, um, you'll, you'll know. So it's almost time for me to close and I wanted to just give you a couple of announcements um, just so you know what's going on. Let's see, what is going on? Well, of course, the office remains closed, but you can contact us by um, calling or emailing info at csl-bellingham.org. I wanted to let you know that our beloved administrative assistant, Clara Duenas, came home from the hospital four days ago, and she's recovering nicely, slowly and nicely, and our nicely and our community is uh, uh, within like two hours her entire care calendar of meals was taken and so we're we're showing up for each other in wonderful wonderful ways um, we have an opportunity to cook for family promise which is a program that provides meals for families experiencing homelessness and they are being housed now in a stationary location and so our week, May 17th, for that week, what we get to do is we get to cook for them a meal every night. We get to provide them with breakfast foods, you know, baskets that might have muffins or granola bars or uh, little yogurt cups or whatever. And um, I am wondering if you would like to be part of that. Uh, the way it's gonna work this time is a little bit different. Typically we go to our host church and we cook right there but because they're being housed in a stationary location, instead, what we're asking is we're asking for seven people or seven families to cook one meal that can be reheated by the families themselves uh, for their meals every single night of the week that we have, starting on May 17th. We're, we're also asking people if they would like to make muffins or breads or buy granola bars or little yogurts or whatever. And if you would like to be involved in this program, please um, email me 
at andreaacevedo at att.net or info at csl-bellingham.org. Our Gourmets for Good program is still looking for hosts. We have 10 or 11 right now, and we sure hope we're gonna be able to get together and have meals together. So if you have an idea for a meal you'd like to offer, even though it's unknown when that can happen, we'd love you to fill out the form online. All right, well, it's time for me to go, so let me do a quick prayer, and I'll see you next week, I hope. Um, and I'll try to connect with you sometime this week on the church grounds, so be watching for a video a uh, little tour and prayer. So here we go. Here's the prayer for today. I accept and know for you, as I know so clearly for myself, that we are held in a vast intelligence and love that knows no limit and has no limit for us. I am open and receptive to the inner knowing of my truest self. And I am asking the deep questions that allow me to evolve and grow in this gifted time of pause and reflection. I refuse to allow myself to enter into distraction or ways of vanishing myself from my inner knowing and instead I embrace the deep truths that are surfacing in me during this time. Not only do I hear them and see them and understand them, but I now am able to move with them crafting my new life that is slowly unfolding out of this pandemic time and allowing this new life to be a place that is more accurate to the sacred human I have become. I am supported in this by a law that allows this to unfold gracefully and wonderfully, and I'm so grateful. And so it is. Blessings, everyone. Thank you for coming.